Welcome to the Functional Health Coaching Show, where we are here to support and answer your questions so that you can help people on a deeper level get real results and grow your health coaching business. Do you have questions you want to ask live on the show? You can call in every Friday at 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time to 1-347-637-1378. Are you looking to increase your credibility and grow your health coaching business using functional lab testing and data-driven protocols so that you can confidently solve health issues? Well, we have the course for you. Go to fdn.today slash show to learn more and sign up today. Okay, let's join today's episode. Well, hey guys, happy Friday. Thanks for tuning in. It is August 7th, 2020, and you're listening to the Functional Health Coaching Show, sponsored by Functional Diagnostic Nutrition. We come to you guys each week, and we help answer questions, help give you guys some support. We used to call this the FDN Support Call, or the Fantastic Friday Call. So just here to support you guys in your journey. If you're looking at taking the FDN course, if you are currently enrolled and moving through the practicals and the videos and the training, uh, or if you're graduated and you have some questions about a client or a situation or a case or something maybe with marketing or business or sales or something of that nature. It's all part of what we do. Um, you're an FDM practitioner, but you're also a business owner. So we get into questions about that too. So from H. pylori to the bottom line to marketing to Facebook, whatever, uh, we cover the whole gamut here, it seems like, on the call. Uh, so again, thanks for spending some time with us here today. We come to you every Friday at 1 o'clock Central Time to, again, just connect. It's been a long-standing FDN tradition to come together on Friday and talk about all things FDN, whatever you need. You guys are the show, so we have questions that are written in, and if you guys want to call in, uh, this is a live call again. To do that, number is 347-637-1378. You can call in, hit one on your keypad, and say you, I'll probably read out your area code and ask for your name. Let us know who you are. And you're welcome to run something by us, ask a question or two, make a comment on somebody else's question if you want to join in that way. We're definitely a group source community. Um, Or just say hello, any way we're happy with. So my name is Brandon Molle. I'm your host uh, for this hour, along with my co-host, Ryan Monaghan. Both of us are FTM practitioners, son of longtime FTM practitioners, and doing some clinical advisorship and consulting. and doing a little bit of teaching along the way. Um, All things FDN, we're happy to be with you again on this Friday, so August 7th, 2020. So somewhere in at least uh, upper uh, northern hemisphere, I guess, is is, is well in underway, and it's kind of trickling down here a little bit, last gasp here of of summer for the next, uh, I guess, officially. depends on where you are. Um, Summer warm weather might last all the way to October like it does here in Kentucky, so um, definitely not over for us. Anyhow, I want to be rude. I want to not neglect my co-host here. So, uh, Ryan, are you there? I want to make sure you're there. We had some tech issues last week. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, but, Ryan, are you there? I, I am here, and you're, you're loud and clear. <laughs> Glad to be okay, here. Okay, good. <laughs> I want to check yeah. in with you every five minutes or if you can cough or sneeze or something every little bit. Make sure, <laughs> make sure I know you're there. <laughs> we had about I'll, a, I'll give you all the About 20 minutes. Yep. Okay, yeah. <laughs> That's what I need. <laughs> Uh, we had about 15, 20 minutes there on the call yesterday where we, we dropped, and I answered a few questions on my own, and I don't think it got recorded. So last week's call, if you see, it's about maybe 25 minutes long. That's why uh, I think uh, I think Josh was able to edit that down and cut edit it up it for down, us yeah. and make it, yeah, splice together there for us. But uh, I think we'll be fine now. We don't have tech issues that often. <laughs> All right. Well, cool. So I've um, got a few announcements for you guys, uh, just a couple of reminders about some things. And then we've also got uh, graduates like we have every week. And we've got, uh, we'll have five that we get to um, give a shout out to here on the call today. We're proud of you guys. But um, announcement wise, um, so, uh, oh yeah, this weekend. Okay, so this weekend, guys, the uh, the Health Coach Certification Summit. Uh, we're launching a brand new summit here for aspiring and existing health coaches who want to advance their knowledge. So Rita is, he's got a bunch of experts he interviewed, over over 20 people. Um, their topics are going to include integrative functional medicine, environmental health, nutrition, the mind-body approach, and a whole lot more there. So uh, it starts tomorrow on August 8th. 
and you guys can check the link there. It's all over the place, all the ways that we communicate with you. Um, so click there and get your spot reserved there. And check it out. Grades a, reads a great interviewer, and we've got a good, awesome lineup of folks there. And it's always good to continue to to be reminded of things, and then of course expand your knowledge. And then many times, you know, we, it's not just the same people over and over again. There's lots of new people up and coming, and so uh, Reed's got a good blend of of folks there um, for the health coach certification summit. So. Uh, right for you guys. Hey, we're health coaches. That's what we do. So very much tailored to to where you are right now. You'll get something out of that for sure. Um, and then also with the FDN conference, we've got the option there for a live stream option. So I think you guys were aware of that. We mentioned the last few times there. So um, you can you can come in person, which is what we plan to do. But if you can't or it's just something that uh, – you feel more comfortable um, being home and not coming out to San Diego in October, then you can opt for the live stream. And so check out the live stream version there. Um, so you get to participate, and it says here, it with speakers, network, and participate in all kinds of educational, fun, and engaging activities. So um, I, I think it won't be just like you're going to get the speakers. So anything we're doing, you're going to try to be, we'll try to immerse you as much into the weekend as possible, <laughs> even though you're not actually there. Um, so uh, it's going to be tremendous. I had so many things I picked up uh, last year, nuggets and thoughts, and just you just get like a like a boost, a big boost from the weekend. So um, this will be year will be the, the same, um, if not better. We're always uh, trying to improve things. So that's October 23rd to the 25th. Um, if you're coming to San Diego Hard Rock Hotel, there, FTNConference.com is the website. So you guys have information details about that. Check out more of the specifics, one of the highlights of the year. So, But you have a, a live stream option. If you want to do that, that's, that fits you better. And uh, I'd rather have a live stream option than nothing. So I love that we actually are offering this last year. Well, I don't know the first year we even had recordings. I know last year we had recordings there. Um, and that's cool, but that's after the fact. right? So um, being there live and feeling the energy and connecting there. It's great. So I love that we have that live stream option because not everybody can make it out, even without the events of the last uh, four or five months here. Uh, still, it's just hard to sometimes fall on the right schedules. Things things come up. Things are happening. So love it that we have an option there. So I'm looking forward to it. So, Okay. Um, Ryan, anything I'm forgetting about? Anything AFTMP-wise or conference-wise you want to mention? <clears throat> No, I think, you know, you just about covered the basis. You know, I'm, I'm still uh, planning personally to to attend the conference in person and I'm um, super excited to be there and, and see all those familiar faces once again, you know, unless something, you know, changes significantly between now and then. I'm going to definitely try to do my best to be there in person, but it's super cool that we're offering that virtual option and, and going to, you know, tailor it in a way that you know, it's still going to be exciting for people even that are at home. Um, I, I heard there's going to be like breakout rooms, even you know where people can have uh, little little private virtual rooms to have certain discussions after a certain lecture. Um, so you know, lots of opportunities too to to make connections, even if it's going to be from home. So that's su- super exciting. True, and that's and that's the benefit yeah. of the live stream for sure, because recordings are cool to listen back to, but still to to have the energy and the interaction, the excitement, that's cool. I love it. So uh, three cheers for technology. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, let's see here. Yeah, good deal. So, uh, graduates. Cool stuff. So, yeah. So, every week we've got graduates. Um, we've got five this week, and it was a pleasure getting to speak to the majority of these um, ladies here um, this week. Um, love to hear everybody's energy and passion and excitement for this. That is the amazing thing. I, it's a It's a gift to me. Uh, every time I get to do a verbal final, um, in the sense that uh, I get to be kind of maybe that's why maybe that's why I've been doing this for over ten years because these verbal finals um, definitely keep me going. I get to hear uh, a person's own personal testimony of their health journey, how what the um, natural approach or uh, functional approach uh, or FD in, per- in particular has helped them with their with their health journey. So I get to hear these testimonies uh, every single week, and then also. Uh, your passion and excitement for what you're doing, what you are about to launch into, uh, that's all totally infectious. 
So I'm kind of um, selfish in that way. I get to hear you guys' stories. I spend the first little bit of that call just getting to know uh, who I'm talking to, you know, and then that helps me to guide also um, where, what to do next, where you're at, where you're at in this process here, and try to uh, help as much as I can on those calls in addition to you know, examining and making sure you guys are good to go up to snuff and you're ready to roll with with certification. Um, but they're awesome calls, so definitely that's the case with everyone I got to talk to um, this week with their excitement and passion and their, their health journey and story. It's very, very inspiring. So, so I thank you guys uh, for that. And uh, we also say congratulations here to these five uh, ladies here. And we are, hey, we're all over the world here today. So mostly in the U.S., but um, we have, um, well, actually, i got to amend one of these here. So Samantha's actually in the U.K. right now. So she's back and forth. But anyhow, uh, Deidre Hackelman is our first one. She's from Virginia. And then Samantha Richmond, we have Australia, but we have the U.K. also. So she's back and forth between those those great countries. And then Sequoia Taylor from Florida. And then on the other coast, Brianne Gates uh, from California. And then Pamela Broger from Texas. So um, we're hitting the coast, and we're right in the middle of the country, and then we're across the pond. So, oh, great, guys. Congratulations. Great job. Awesome. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Button didn't work. <laughs> Yay, good Congratulations, job, everyone. Agile. So cool. It's so cool to see uh, FDNs, too, graduating from overseas. And I know uh, at both FDN conferences, uh, one thing I always look forward to is getting to meet, you know, some of those FDNs that, that will travel from the U.K. and beyond uh, to be at the conference. So Indeed. pretty neat. Yep. It is very cool. It is very cool. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe I'll take this time, maybe on a more somber note, um, uh, but uh, the explosion there in, in Lebanon, in Beirut, um, I don't know if you guys are uh, know an FDM practitioner that's there. She's fine. Um, but uh, Berna Corey, um, she was at the last conference. Uh, great practitioner, awesome person, um, very, very sweet girl. But uh, heard about the explosion and immediately reached out. Um, so if you guys know Berna or, or are concerned about things, they had... You know, damage to property, but nothing to people. And so they're just trying to rebuild, and she covered it, um, our thoughts and prayers uh, right now at this time. So, But uh, but she's good, um, but just kind of the whole rebuilding process. And so um, just, we don't, I don't know if they know exactly what has happened and transpired, but regardless, there's damage to people, um, lives lost, and to uh, property. So, but if you guys are concerned, let's let her know that she's, that she's doing okay, and i um, sure she wouldn't mind uh Somebody reaching out there too, so somehow that we can we can help. Thanks All for right. letting us know that. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah, Burn is a sweetheart. She did a great job in the course. Very, uh, very uh, apt practitioner. Um, young for sure, which is great. So I love to see the young uh, energy and stuff there. And she came all the way from from Lebanon to uh, to the FDN conference last year, and uh, uh, very very kind uh, person there, and so she's doing some great work uh, where she's at, and so we just uh, wish her the best and and uh, thank, uh, thankful that uh, she's safe and okay. All right. Well, guys, we'll, we'll transition to some questions here. Um, so, um, actually, hey, you guys are lining up here. That's great. A lot of you guys on today. Thanks again for joining us, and then uh, several hands raised already, so we'll be able to jump into questions. So I guess, Ryan, before I do that, anything you wanted to mention or say? Um, I don't mean to neglect you there on, in any oh, way. Oh, no, no worries, Brandon. I appreciate that. So, yeah, one thing to, to add quickly is that Jennifer Woodward and I, on the over at the AFDNP group, uh, we just wrapped up a four-part series looking at a complex client case for the uh, quick and nerdy segment, is what we're calling it. And it's essentially where we take 20 or 30 minutes or so just to deliver a quick, uh, you know, clinical insight or soundbite on a, on a very specific topic and go, go a little more deeper than wide. It's not quite as uh, in-depth as the, as the detective hour, but it's almost a miniature version of that. Um, but just wanted to mention if anyone had any ideas or topics that they would like covered, uh, f- feel free to shout out to me. Um, if you're on, friends with me on Facebook, uh, send me a private message or just mention it in the AFDNP group. Um, or you can just uh, email direct me, uh, uh, directly email me too at uh, ryan.monahan at afdnp.com. 
So there you go. Very good. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, a lot of things we do, guys. It's 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 you guys are dictating uh, where things go and questions that you have, right? So yeah, there's the there's the foundations and there's the things that we stick to and abide by as as FDM practitioners. But uh, a lot of it's what you guys are are needing, what you're seeing out there, what you have questions about um, that you want us to to address. And so very much, um, like I said, group sourced and um, group guided. You know, this 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 call is one of those things. But love to hear from you. So things you're struggling with, have questions about, want to get into. You know, we there's many ways to get a hold of us and let your voice be heard. So we do welcome that for sure. Mhm. Mhm. Okay. All right. Well, let's take some hands here. So I've got a couple hands raised already. A 408 area code 978. Um, that's all for right now. So, okay, so 408. Let's say hello to 408, area code. 408, what's your name there? Hi. Hi, Brandon hello. and Ryan. This is Kristen. Hi, can you hear me? We sure can. Hey, Yeah, hey, Kristen, what's up? Hi, I'm doing well. How are you both today? <laughs> Can't complain. We're doing awesome. Beautiful day. <laughs> mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, my question is regarding the GI map and H. pylori. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, Sounds like um, a good topic. When, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think this is like a pretty popular one. But when H. pylori is detected on the GI map, but it's within their normal or acceptable range, um, why in the antibiotic resistant genes do some tests? For clients, say NA, and others say negative versus positive. So, uh, just to be mm-hmm. clear, Kristen, are you referring to the virulence factors or the part at the bottom of the test where it's referring to the antibiotic resistance? I think you're referring to the latter. Yeah, the latter, the antibiotic resistance area where for some clients it will just say NA and then for others it will say negative versus positive and I'm wondering if this is just um, if there's no difference and it's just the way they've chosen to sometimes use NA and other times negative or positive or is there a difference? Brendan, I'm not sure if you know the specific answer to that but I can give a more general answer um, and then I'll, I'll yeah, let go, Brendan. Start with uh, general. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. I would say as a more more general answer, and it, it's and I I don't say this to be flippant, but it it is a bit of a moot point, um, okay. only from the perspective that um, you know that that is referring to d- different antibiotics that the client may or may not respond to. So if if someone may be to a particular antibiotic, that what that would mean is that if their doctor would prescribe that antibiotic, then they, their body would not respond to it and it wouldn't be effective at eradicating mm-hmm. the H. pylori. So uh, that would apply if, if you're referring out to a GI specialist or a, a licensed medical practitioner in that case. Um, you right. would just want to let the client know, like, hey, if you do decide to take uh, the antibiotic route here, that these are the antibiotics you would not respond to, and you should let your doctor know that. Um, Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure you've experienced this when, you know, given when the client has a choice of doing a self-treatment option, you know, nine times out of 10 or more, they're going to want to do the mastic gum route or like Metula T and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And and of course, we always want to give them the option and, you know, educate our clients on, on different uh, paths they can take. Um, right. But as far as, as far as FDN world is concerned, um, of course, we don't prescribe, we don't treat, we don't diagnose. So um, it's, it's not as though, you know, at least most of us who aren't licensed um, don't have access to those antibiotics. Um, but it's just right. something to be aware of if you're, if you're referring out. Well, what do you think, I Brandon? just had a, oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> No, no worries. Go ahead. I'm uh, just, yeah, I was wondering, because it does sound moot to me, the difference between NA or negative, but I just wondered if that has come up for you on your test in the past and if you've noticed that. My, my guess is I, th- I think they're just about the same, um, unless it l- lists that a certain antibiotic is resistant, I think that if it's not applicable or if it's uh, negative, 
then mm-hmm. it's, it's, I'm pretty sure it's more or less the same thing. Um, okay. I don't have ex- um, precise notes on that in front of me, but um, usually I'm just kind of scanning that section pretty quickly. Um, yeah, just to see if, if any antibiotic resistance comes up just in case, you know, a client does want to refer out, uh, you know, do, and check in with their medical doctor and, and uh, talk those results over. That's where that would apply. Right. Yeah, I, I'm going to have to go with a general um, response there, Ryan. Had, that's exactly how I, I look at that section there and how I think we should there. Specifically, yes, yeah, so that's a good question. We're going to have to get back to you on that one. I have to find out yeah. uh, for that because I, I pulled up a handful of them um, that I have here. And, you know, some of them are NA, some of them are absent, some of them are present, uh, some of them, um, yeah. So there's different ways they're noting that. You think they would stay really consistent with that, so exactly what that means Mm, that's a good question. So I, I think we it take more of a uh, practical, yeah, practical approach to that. Is it you know is this significant to to going over the case right now? Um, right. So just like Ryan said, a quick glance at it typically. Okay. Well, that's you know, very helpful. Mm-hmm. I, if I had to guess, I would say that not applicable means that those particular antibiotic drugs don't don't apply to. H. pylori, but that that would make me wonder why they would put them on there to begin with if they weren't applicable. Um, so that, mm-hmm. that is a bit odd, Brandon. Like what you mentioned, you'd think they would just uh, stay consistent with either that, you know, negative positive designation versus uh, not applicable. Mm-hmm. Let me. Yeah. Um, that, you might be onto something there as far as how this is um, this is put out here. Let me let me actually grab up a. Um uh, a GI map that is a, a known positive. Let's see if that mm. comes back a little differently. So um, we're we're running through a little round of motility at our house right now. So I have some positive there you results go. here. So um, <laughs> I did so well, earlier okay. th- earlier this year. Did you? Okay. Okay. That's not that's not yep. a bad tea. I just have to find get my timing right. I don't mind it on at the all. Empty stomach side of things. No. Yeah. No. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we might be onto something here. So if it is, um, if it's NA, that seems to correlate with actually not a finding on the H. pylori. So, so if it's NA, it's not applicable because we're looking at specific antibiotic resistance to H. pylori, uh, specifically. So that would be, um, NA. And then they're going to switch over to absent or presence, it says here. If it is mm-hmm. positive, um, so yes, yeah, so it is real H. pylori focused. Um, depending on the lab you run, if you run it through in Europe, you've got um, a few more markers that they give you, different ones that are there. But yeah, that's what it is. So NA would be not applicable um, because there's no H. pylori detected, so they yeah. um, wouldn't wouldn't report that. So that's yeah, that's what that is. Uh, well, this <laughs> particular test it was present, but it was just within their acceptable. Or normal range. Yeah, yeah. So it's 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 an automatic thing on that report there. So it, our range is what we're looking for as far as you know. Do we recommend addressing it or not? Um, it, it actually has to be high, flagged as red, as far as their ranges go for them for it not to be an NA scenario where it's present oh, or absent. Oh, I see. Absent. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm, so yeah, it's automated. It. So it's it's only you're saying, Brandon, if it's only above the reference range, will it trigger? the report down below for the antibiotic resistance? Yes, as far as it's mm-hmm. saying uh, absence or presence, they actually test for it. If it's not applicable, okay. that means that they would uh, not be testing for it. Oh, mm-hmm. wow. Okay, that, yep. makes that makes sense now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, got it. Okay, awesome. well, that answers my question. <laughs> cool, yeah, so on the fly, a little discovery, <laughs> a little yeah, discovery yeah. there for us, but I think that's where we're going to stand on that one. Yeah, how cool. Awesome. Thank you so much to both of you. Hey, you're welcome. You're welcome. Any follow-up question to that, or are you you're good? I think I'm good for today. Okay, awesome. Thanks for calling in. Cool. Thanks for All checking right. on that, Brandon. Good find. Yeah, sure. Mystery solved there. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, it's, I, yeah, it's, yeah. I'm kind of like you, Ryan. It's like pragmatic approach. Like, oh, okay. All right, so... We're not really dealing with that, but it is interesting to see. I have the only theme I've ever noticed down there um, before is it seems like 
uh, people that work in a hospital setting, uh, mm-hmm. medical, you know, nurse or somebody like that, um, that seems mm-hmm. to be the category that the most um, antibiotic resistance that I've noticed theme-wise, if any at all, mm-hmm. that's the only thing I've noticed there. So most of the time there's not even uh, uh, any kind of antibiotic resistance, but if there is, it seems to be people that work in uh, medical field directly. Whatever that's mm-hmm. worth, that I've sense. just noticed that yeah. as, a, as a theme. Yeah. So. Yeah, and, and you know, and again, taking that kind of practical perspective, I can I can tell you from from my own experience with my in my practice with my clients, I, I don't think I can ever recall a, a case where there was a client who who did want to go the antibiotic route. Uh, I'm sure there are many FDNs who've had clients that have wanted to to uh, take the antibiotics and and talk over the results with their doctor, but um, in my own experience. Uh, Clients usually want to go with the mastic gum products or the tea, the Matula tea. Same for me. That's what I've noticed also. Yep. If it, yeah. uh, if I do feel like they need to go more of a medical route, um, that's even challenging to get them to do that a little bit. I have to kind of withhold yeah. and, and kind of play tough and say, hey, I think you really need to go get this checked out. Um, so referring yeah. out is not uh, admitting defeat. It's what's best for that client. And, and then it may still ultimately and often does – uh, the ball gets kicked back into your court, and and you kind of take it from there. But you've done your uh, due diligence, and what you're supposed to do as an unlicensed practitioner, and um, following all the recommendations there. Uh, but yeah, most people um, they can't wait to start on those those pathogen protocols. That's right. Yeah, they've been looking for answers for years in many cases, and they're just thrilled to find something that correlates with what they're going through, and they're just mm-hmm. you know ready to ready to see some improvement. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yep. All right. Well, 978 area code. We'll take our next caller here. So 978, um, I'm I'm meeting you. What's your name, 978? Hello. uh, It's Donna Sack again. (laughs) How are you? Hey, Donna. Well, hi there, Donna. Hi. Um, Yeah, so, um, Ryan, that quick and nerdy, this might be a subject to to talk about down the road. Um, It's about constipation. I I have a client who um, started her protocol uh, back at the end of June, and um, we, uh, intelligent allopathy, we used relief care of the LBF number one while she Mm -hmm. started her protocol. And it it actually, after, she's had had this problem for 30 years, by the way, Um, and we detected on the GI map. Uh, H. pylori was detected, and there was dysbiosis and lots of things that correlated with constipation and the bloating. So um, for relief care, we started her with the LBF. She had about three days of relief, um, and then the the it, it there was no more relief. Meanwhile, she continued with her uh, protocol, which was the GID talk and then biocidin, and then the mastic gum, all in that order, and digest gold. And she was really careful about sequencing and titration. Um, and, then, uh, and then for um, the, the next thing was uh, a glutathione precursor, NAC. And at that point, she got in trouble where she was in so much pain and bloating, and she couldn't, she didn't have a bowel movement for almost a week and uh, she just stopped everything all at once. Um, In the interim, during this, um, there was trifala powder added and magnesium citrate. I'm frustrated. I I looked up the database, the AFDNP natural medicine database and found that actually there are five things in biocidin that may cause the, an adverse reaction being constipation. What's your experience? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it sounds like you're dealing with, you know, one of those kind of more rare cases where a client's uh, just ultra sensitive and more, uh, you know, deeper digging and and uh, some troubleshooting here and there. Um, and it, you know, you it sounds like the the plan that you laid out for her was was pretty rock solid. Um, mm-hmm. In listening to you describe that case again, there, there were there were a couple things that that came up for me uh, when you were describing it, that that made me think she she might actually be dealing with with SIBO. 
which is yeah. small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So I'm not, I'm not sure if you've investigated that with her or considered that. Um, but if you're dealing with an issue where you've tried binders and low uh, and that LBF formula and uh, magnesium citrate and, you know, different forms of allopathic, um, you know, care, relief care, um, and you haven't really gotten very far with it, it, it could be that there's something deeper going on um, that's, you know, not being addressed by, by those supplements. So um, chronic constipation is, is definitely can be a red flag for, for a SIBO issue, especially methane-dominant SIBO. Um, and methane-dominant SIBO is actually characterized by an overgrowth of archaea in the small intestine. The interesting thing there is that archaea are a totally different class of organism. They're not bacteria. They're not parasites. They're not yeast. They're not viruses. Uh, archaea are their own class of organism. Um, and, they, and everyone has archaea in their gut. But just like with uh, hydrogen-dominant SIBO, you can get an overgrowth of these archaea, which are methane-producing organisms. Uh, and what can happen in that case is that those methane-producing organisms, they can slow down gut motility so that you're getting backed up and you're getting the s- symptoms of constipation. Um, and the excess of methane gas itself, it could lead to bloating, which I, I heard you mentioning she was having a lot of bloating. Um, yeah. So I have seen that with SIBO, too, where, where a client may not respond well to biocidin or other antimicrobials. And my suspicion there is just that things are kind of getting stirred up. Um, and, you know, you might need to experiment with different forms of antimicrobials and, and take it a lot slower in that case. But, uh, you know, SIBO can be tricky. It's its kind of own, own, um, its own condition with its own set of considerations. Um, I definitely would recommend, because it's such a big topic, the advanced course on small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, the FDN advanced course. Uh, it's really fantastic introduction into that world um, to learn more about, you know, protocols and how to, how to address SIBO comprehensively. Um, so, you know, that being said, um, my first recommendation um, would be if, if I saw that and it was my own client, and I saw that she was experiencing a lot of constipation and bloating, um, I would probably be running a, a SIBO breath test uh, to see if, you know, methane or hydrogen gases are, are building up and they're elevated. Um, that might indicate uh, something deeper going on there. Um, in which case, to take that one step further, it's not just about killing off the bacteria, but also addressing all of the, the confounding variables that might contribute to SIBO to begin with. So it could be H. pylori and parasites, you know, that uh, could be in part uh, playing into that. could be low stomach acid. Um, You can also see uh, like slow motility is definitely uh, par for the course with SIBO, in which case you're also looking at possibly introducing motility agents, like things that help to stimulate movement in the intestines so that you're moving bacteria and debris back down. Um, almost when you, when you've got SIBO, it's almost as though the plumbing is back backing up. And it, when we're normally fasting in between meals and you're a relatively healthy person, our, our, our intestines have this cleansing wave in between meals, right? Where mm-hmm. we're moving bacteria and debris down into the small intestine. But someone with, with SIBO may have lost that ability um, due to a history of food poisoning. Uh, there could be an autoimmune component there going on that's causing destruction to the, the nerves in the small intestine. Um, there's a number of reasons that can contribute to that. But um, in that case, um, things like magnesium citrate or vitamin C or some of these uh, allopathic relief care remedies may not, um, may not be enough um, if there's a something more serious going on. So uh, that's just something to consider. Um, uh, you know, probably probably went more into depth there than you were looking for, but <laughs> uh, that's... No, uh, I, I, that's, yeah. that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, yeah, sure. And, and I, but I came across 
also, um, just in, you know, while I investigate that, stun enemas that have not, they only help very temporarily. Um, I don't know if you know about colon hydrotherapy. Is that something that might help her during this period? Mm. Has, she, um, has she done it in the past with success? She's never done colon hydrotherapy. She's only done enemas. Mm. Brandon, colon hydrotherapy you know goes that? further in. Yeah, it's not not something uh, I've personally done or have much experience with, but I'm curious to, yeah. to, to see what Brandon has to say. Yeah, so with the SIBO situation, I, I've not studied or heard of things about that direct connection, but a, as a general whole, I think colon hydrotherapy can be super helpful to really do a lot of of cleaning out and and getting a lot of things out of the way. So if you're if you do a you know water enema at home, you're only going to go have water going up so far into the really colon. You do you don't get nearly as far into the system uh, your intestines as you would with colon hydrotherapy with a you know machine or uh, gravity or forced uh, water there with a uh, qualified a practitioner to do that. Um, I think it's great. I think uh, for her, I think it's something I would consider also, just maybe for some relief. Um, I think you still have to probably look at all the things that Ryan's mentioning here. He had a great thorough answer on that. Um, but for right now, for some relief, um, I'm, I've, I'm a big fan of those. I've, I've done many of those myself, um, send clients that direction to different practitioners throughout the country. So I think it's something I would, would consider for her as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, I might also throw That's in here, helpful. you know, uh, bio, yeah, bioflow. You might want to think about bioflow. Um, that could be mm-hmm. a consideration yep. there also. Mm-hmm. And maybe even heavy metals. I don't know how that would factor in as well. So maybe an HTMA, looking and seeing what you can see, some things coming up on a test like that. Uh, something like, Donna, you've always, uh, several people you've called in about were more of those complex cases, uh, long-term cases. Uh-huh. Uh, so you're getting, getting the practice them, there with... <laughs> <laughs> well, and I you're going to be really good at those. I, I have to tell you, I don't know if you, yeah, th- so I've called in about one case, um, which was very complex, and I finally, through the Facebook um, platform, uh, what I figured out was I believe my client has um, what's called um, Lyme disease. Oh, wow. Mm. Yeah, and it was only you know, digging, digging. And finally I said, okay, I spent two more hours just asking her questions and it was never on the intake forms or maybe it is. And I'm just not aware of it. Have you ever had a tick bite? And, um, Mm. somebody on Facebook of FDN said, you know, gee, she's having a problem with red meat. Sometimes you can get an allergy, um, from a tick. And, um, I, I asked her and it turns out exactly when her symptoms started, was when she got the tick bite with a bullseye rash, and and she had one um, round of uh, the doxycycline, and that was it. And they never gave it a second thought. She and her mother, and I and I said, okay, time to see a Lyme literate doctor. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. That doesn't surprise me, actually, Donna, because when we had spoken, uh, I think it was about a few weeks ago, I had mentioned that mold illness might actually be you know, a factor in her health complications, given right. all of the serious, the seriousness of the symptoms she was dealing with. And what I've found is that the symptoms of mold illness and Lyme are almost nearly identical. There's maybe like mm-hmm. a 5% difference, you know, in terms of the symptom presentation, uh, but they can, they can look very, very similar to each other in terms of how they present. Um, so, yeah. and I've seen this too, where, where people may get, uh, you know, mischaracterized or, or even misdiagnosed by a doctor as, as having a Lyme issue, um, when in fact it might be a, a, a mold issue and then, you know, vice versa. <laughs> um, taking that one step further, there, there's also a theory that um, when you're exposed to a lot of mold toxins, that can cause the immune system to become more aggressive against Lyme. In other words, it's kind of stirring up a more intense inflammatory reaction. So uh, the, the sort of theory there is that um, the, lot, the, the mold and or the mold toxins are actually what's um, <clears throat> contributing to the Lyme and that the mold issue is actually, in that case, it could be further upstream than the Lyme issue and they could actually be kind of uh, 
tied into each other or contributing to each other. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good memory, Ryan. Thank you. Um, yeah. Cause that's, <laughs> oh, sure. uh, she, she, she had migratory, I mean, she would have a swollen knee and then the severe yeah. neck pain and then the migraines. It was all over the map. And uh, yeah. finally, yeah. after, yeah. And whenever she mentioned the tick bite, it, then I really dug into the research and saw, it, wow, this all fits. And she's seen many doctors, and I don't think anyone actually, you know, they didn't seem to think it was an issue when she was, what, 11 years old when it happened, um, because it was taken care of with a round of antibiotics. But in this case, it, I don't think it was. So, uh, You know, j- just to throw this out there, and, and um, it's fantastic if she's actually found out that she's, you know, been able to identify an active Lyme infection or co-infection. But I, I worked uh, earlier this year with a client, and she came to me with a Lyme diagnosis as her main health challenge, and, and of course all the the symptoms that go along with that. She was she was experiencing really chronic migraines on a on a day to day basis, every single day, really debilitating migraines. And I I explained to her the the potential connection between mold and Lyme. And I, you know, I basically asked her, Hey, you know, just humor me and let's, uh, let's run some tests to look at a potential mold pattern. And, uh, sure enough, uh, she ran an ERMI test in her home and the, the mold spore counts were through the roof. They were literally above the reference range. I think they were about two to three times above the, the reference range on the lab. Um, and she, um, she also was presenting with significant amounts of mold and fungal overgrowth uh, on her organic acid test, which you'll usually see correlate. If someone's living in a moldy home, then those mold spores will tend to colonize the gut. And you'll often see those two present or, or correlate with each other really well, the, the ERMI test and the oat test. So um, she had like a very, very clear, um, there was not a shred of ambiguity there that she was dealing with a mold issue. Um, so that was, that was pretty new to her. Um, and so, you know, it, we're, it, t- it took, definitely took a while to kind of work through some of those issues and, and eventually get to a point where she could remediate. But the, the other interesting thing, too, is that we ran a, a DNA connections. Uh, it's a urine uh, PCR Lyme test. And uh, she was negative for every single strain of Lyme. Now, um, I'll admit that tests are just tests. They're not always perfect. And that Lyme tests are notorious for false positives <laughs> or, and or false negatives, uh, but mostly right. the latter, right? Even the best Lyme tests out there. And that's why, you know, Lyme has always been traditionally a clinical diagnosis, meaning that um, a, a Lyme literate doctor will only diagnose Lyme based on the symptom presentations um, even if even if someone is not presenting for any, you know, Bartonella, Babesia uh, antibodies, and so forth. Um, but I just mm-hmm. thought I would throw that out there because in this case, um, it was suspect whether it was actually ever a Lyme issue, um, and I, I really kind of stood by my guns in, in that particular case with that client that it was though that, that it was a mold issue. Okay. Very interesting. Yep. Mm-hmm. Or both. Good stuff. Yeah, yeah it could be both. <laughs> I'm, I'm learning from you. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> well, well, Donna, keep it up. So uh, yeah, you've got some more complex people, and those are going to come along. You know, as a practitioner, you're going to have, uh, you know, 20 clients that everything is just really easy, and this the the foundational things which you have set up for every person I've had you, you know, consulted with you on. You do a great job of that. So. Just pure foundational, the basics of FDN, setting that up, you do a very good job. And you're right, when that's not quite getting it, um, then you've got to think a little bit elsewhere and think about some different things and sometimes dig a little bit deeper. But the majority of the time, it's going to be pretty straightforward and, and relatively easy. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, you do have these complex cases here, and you grow as a practitioner, and you, you know, you're able to help other people now. What you've learned, and just on this call here today, being recorded for, for history, um, we can... 
Be aware of other possibilities. Again, you don't have to be an expert on these things, but you need to know, okay, well, what does lime look like? What does mold look like? What do these other things look like? Maybe that is something I need to reach out to the community for help on. Okay. Thank you. And, you yeah, know, I, I, I wish I could get an easy one again. I just, my husband was the <laughs> easiest. He was just, he had psoriasis, and then he didn't. It was great. You know, he had gastric, <laughs> of gastritis, and then he didn't. Oh, I want more people like that. Oh. <laughs> um, sure. I, I, I understand. I understand. But we're here to help. We'll, we'll do the best we can to, to help you out and guide you in the right direction. And if that, if, if you have that, uh, 100% commitment, and your client does too, and knows this is the only way to go, then I think that's an unstoppable combination. You will get answers. Yep. Okay. Yep. And it's just like Brandon said, you don't necessarily even need to have an in-depth knowledge of some of these more complex uh, issues like mold or, or Lyme. Of course, we're always all learning as we go. But the brilliant and beautiful thing about the DRESS protocol is that it, it does most of the heavy lifting. And even for those with really complex health issues, you can still really help move someone in the right direction with those foundations and fundamentals. Never, never mm-hmm. uh, discredit mm-hmm. the power of DRESS. That's what I've learned more and more uh, the longer I've done this. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm all, was right all along. All those- Yep, yeah. he was right all along. <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, I, and I've certainly uh, I was talking about a uh, the same topic with a fellow FDN recently about how I spent some time going really deep down a a rabbit hole studying all of the nutrigenomics and and biochemistry of you know things like MTHFR and COMT and some of those uh, genetic mutations or SNPs that can show up. Um, and ultimately, it, it all sort of uh, coalesced and, and led me back to dress. <laughs> um, I realized um, after kind of diving into those really deep, complex details that, you know, at the end of the day, uh, it's, it's not your genes. It's the environment around your genes that determine your health outcomes. So you'll even hear it said in the, in the nutrigenomic world that your genes are, are like a gun and the environment is the trigger, right? So you, you may hear people say, oh, you know, I have this or that gene and that's why I have an autoimmune disease. And it's like, well, um, maybe, but it's actually probably uh, much more likely there was some kind of uh, stressor in throughout some time, you know, at some point throughout your life, whether that was poor diet or a significantly stressful or traumatic event. Um, or a buildup of toxins in your system that kind of tip the scales. Um, it's, it's really the environment that causes our genes to misbehave. Uh, it's not the other way around. Uh, at least that's, that's how I look at it. I'm, I'm not really uh, sure if the conventional world is ca- kind of really caught up to that viewpoint. Um, but, um, yeah, just yeah. kind of another I, way to, to say that, yeah. Yeah, I had this very same conversation with my sister earlier, and it was about macular degeneration because I have uh, the mutations, I have the SNPs for it, my mother had it. And mm-hmm. I said to her, doesn't mean I'm going to get it. I'm going to right. take certain supplements. I'm going to eat, the, you know, diverse food. I exercise, do everything I can. And she's saying, well, you can't control this. I said, well, actually, I can influence it. That's right. And I love that. And the dress principle. Mm-hmm. You, genes, genes might yeah. describe a certain tendency towards a particular condition, but it's not destiny. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I believe that 100%. Oh. That's awesome. Both of you guys coming out with some good lines there. You should write those down. <laughs> I, I, believe me, <laughs> nice, I've got nice a lot to of the these point. Ca- got, I've got a lot of these cataloged away in the back of my brain. <laughs> you, we could, you never we know. We make bumper sure. stickers. That's right. There we go. People will be like, what is, what is this bumper sticker? Genes are not, genes are not destiny. <laughs> what is he talking about? <laughs> yep. Make them, make them think a little bit. That's great. Yeah. We, yeah. We, the, the one earlier was we, I was saying to my sister, we are what we eat ate. And she, she had trouble with that one. <laughs> mm. Say that again. We are what we, mm-hmm. we are what we eat ate. 
I heard that from Mark Hyman. I can't take credit for it. Gosh, A-T-E. Yeah, cool. <laughs> so yes. past tense. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yes. Mm-hmm. So if you're eating yep. um, you know, a cow yep. that wasn't 100% pasture raised and they ate exactly. out of a box of soy, wheat, and corn that was uh, full of Roundup, then we are what we eat ate. <laughs> Yep, exactly. Yeah, you know, I'm actually uh, reading. Highly recommend it to everyone listening. Uh, Sacred Cow just came out a few weeks ago. A book by Diana Rogers, who's a biodynamic farmer and registered dietitian, and she co-wrote that with Rob Wolf, who's a well-known name in the paleo and the keto community. Um, and the book is all about making a case for better meat, um, and it and it also aims to debunk some of the, the myths behind, um, you know, m- meat being bad for your health and, and even some of the ethical concerns and uh, goes into depth about uh, how regenerative farming with uh, grass-fed cattle, you know, is better for the soil, better for the environment. Um, really, really well laid out, really well researched, um, but goes all into that too about how, you know, how, how um, inhumane is for these cows to be treated on these industrial feedlots um, because it's kind of stacked on top of each other. Uh, in some cases being fed, not just grains and corn, but also in, in GMO grains and that sort of thing. But um, in some cases like Skittles and, and like candy that's been rejected from factories, um, just mm. pr- pretty, pretty terrifying mm. stuff that they, they're giving mm. to these uh, conventionally raised cattle, you know, versus a wow. versus a cow that's been given a, a really good life and is you know grazing on pastured lands and helping to also regenerate the soil in the process and uh, you know much much different. It's is so D- Diana Rogers says it, it's not the cow, it's the how, right? So uh, in other words, mm-hmm. she's saying you know there's often these debates mm-hmm. about um, in in certain circles about how, you know, unethical it is to, to eat meat because of how they're treated and, and so on. Um, but, uh, you know, not all meat is created equal. There's a, it's night and day, the difference between grass fed beef and, you know, conventionally raised beef. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm well aware. hundred uh-huh. percent. Yes, Exactly. Yep, I can tell it. We have a we have our our farmer that we get, it's all our beef comes from one farmer, and she does an amazing job with her animals and above what uh, any any farmer I've ever known to do for their animals. And you can taste it in the meat, and I can feel it in my body. And I had it for lunch, yeah. so I'm I'm feeling good on some beef here right now. It's one of my favorite foods. <laughs> yep. Well, hmm. check out that book, Brandon. Check out Sacred Cow. Yes, it'll, I will. It'll even- It'll further strengthen your resolve to to eat meat. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The grill is fired up every weekend. That's for sure at our house. So, good stuff. Yeah, same here. Yep. Mhm. Cool. All right, well, Donna. Well, good stuff. Thanks for calling in. Great questions. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for calling. Talk with you soon. Thanks again. All right. Well, a few minutes left here. Um, I've got a hand raised, but I do want to make one answer one question here I had come in because I have a little information about this now um, as of, I think, earlier this week. So um, people are asking about, is there a new uh, version of the test comparison worksheet? So uh, yes, mm-hmm. there will be one. It's it's in the works. And so uh, and to, to speak to that, so every single access stress and hormone panel that comes through that we run, you guys run, Reed looks at every single one of those. So one of the ways that we had determined uh, FD and optimums, and, and Reed is really good at finding, noticing patterns and looking at the first test and also retest and who's getting better. The whole process that Reed went through for about 10 years developing FDN, uh, that's still at work. And so that's what we're doing right now, more with the access panel. So between our observations as, as mentors, clinical advisors, Reed looking at every single one of these, looking at cases there, and also talking with Access Lab, you know, they, they talked about optimums within those ranges that are there. So they have what their feel for the optimums are. So with all that knowledge together, we're putting together an updated comparison worksheet. So we want to keep that around because we know not everybody's going to use necessarily technology. It might be more paper and pencil. It might just be simple spreadsheet. It may not be biochemic and different things that are out there. They're awesome tools. 
um, practitioners come with different um, desires and levels and flavors, right? So, um, so a new comparison worksheet is in the works. Um, we'll have. To, um, I can't give you a date on that, but we'll be relatively soon because those are uh, becoming fast established there for us. And so, might be a few tweaks, but we'll have that coming. So that is something um, you guys will be able to utilize. And I personally lobbied very hard for that because I, I like that comparison worksheet, especially the comparison side there for you guys. So, um, so that's coming. So don't don't worry about that. But we'll have also some other options as far as right. using uh, uh, artificial intelligence and technology there, uh, especially through biochemic. Um, Jeremy Maleka, uh, his technology there um, to help you guys also. So you have some options. Um, ultimately, it comes down to getting the most information you can from that lab work, clinically correlating, and then producing results-driven protocols. So a little quick announcement there. I think that's something I could do. I'm not in trouble for mentioning that, so we're excited about that. So there we go. All right, so a few minutes left here, and I've got another hand raise. I'm going to grab 631 area code. Uh, 631, what's your name there? Hey, it's Andrea. It's good to be back. How are you? Well, there's Andrea. Good to hear from you. Hey. Yeah, yeah. Great conversation on mold, too. Um, so I was going to say, um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I guess my question is this, is I have to get back involved in the clinical end. I, didn't, I, I don't know why I didn't complete the final, um, what do you call it, exit interview. So if you can support yeah, me on that, I want to get that lined up and, and, uh, and get going. I'm working with a new um, um, functional uh, diagnostic uh, naturopath doctor. And so oh. I, my question is this, um, I guess I have to get up to speed with some of the new labs. I wanted to hear from anybody out there, though, what they're finding. Talk me about meats and proteins with the Beyond Meat. Any side effects? How are our bodies digesting these new protein products coming out? Has anybody heard? I know they taste good. Mm. I, I've heard that they taste good. I'm kind of a little wary about uh, eating it myself. <laughs> Why does that book talk about Beyond Meat? <laughs> Um, yeah, so I'm about uh, 100 pages into the book, so uh, so far they haven't mentioned Beyond Meat, but uh, I can tell you, uh, I, I, I can't say I'm a fan of the idea. I mean, if you look at the ingredients, you know, it's just like over 30 things you can't pronounce, and like canola oil and industrial seed, oil, seed oils and soy protein isolates, and um, it's just a bunch of fake processed stuff. And um, I, I can't even begin to imagine what that could do to someone's metabolism. Uh, you know, I haven't heard any specific reports of, of adverse health effects, but uh, at the same yeah. time, I feel, like, I feel like it's only a matter of time. I, you know, I say this, too, as a former vegan. I was vegan for about 10 years of my life. It was through, through most of my 20s. Um, and, uh, you know, it didn't work for me. You know, I uh, can't say with certainty that it that can't work for, for some people. Um, but, uh, definitely didn't work for me. And I, I really, uh, hit a rock bottom with my health when I was on a vegan diet, just in terms of my energy and my, and my mood and my digestion was all off. And it, and it took me several years to get my health back on track. Um, and, uh, yeah, I wouldn't touch those things with a, with a 10 foot pole. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly it, my thinking. It, it seems actually, like too to hear what's going to come about be, between GMOs and everything else, and now this processed protein garbage in the lab. Um, I was yeah. just wondering if anybody had any updated reports on it. Yeah, t time will kind of tell. There, I think it's just uh, things right. like this book we're talking about, and us out there talking about that you know, animal products are not uh, necessarily harmful, like we've you know been told for years and so changing some right. of that paradigm that understanding there is important and probably if you want a, a vegetarian burger there's 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 even cleaner burgers out there that that are quinoa or rice or um you know oh, true yeah. whole food so i guess it always goes back to like get as whole food as you can even if you are eating a vegan diet uh, if that's you know your diet for your body or not but get as whole as you can that's the thing is of these uh, well, we have, it's great to have alternatives when you have allergies and sensitivities um, to things, but you also have to look at the quality still. That still is going to reign supreme. So it's good to mm -hmm. keep that in mind. So good stuff. 
Yeah, there's a big difference between a Beyond Burger, which is kind of kind of just like a Frankenstein burger, uh, versus like what Brandon said and something that you know there there are definitely like you know black bean burgers and things that are made from whole foods yeah. without without all the processed stuff in there. Indeed, indeed. Mm-hmm. But I'll, I'll have a little of that if I have to. But I'd rather have a, a grass fed beef burger uh, any day. So. All right. Mm-hmm. Well, guys, good I agree. call today. This is great. So we're we're down to the wire here on time. So I um, want to thank our callers. Good good questions here, Andrea and Kristen and Donna. So good conversation, Ryan. Thanks for your awesome insights. Very cool. I'm I'm learning stuff here on this call as well. So we always we learn together. And uh, we've got five graduates. So Deidre, Samantha, Sequoia, Brianne, and Pamela. Ladies, congratulations. Great job. And, uh, hey, we'll do this again next week, guys. So tune in, and yeah. thanks for spending your hour with us. Ryan, thanks a lot, man. Thanks, Brandon. Talk to you soon. Bye, guys. <laughs>